Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick and then we can get started here. All right. <clears throat> so, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Erin Berman, and I am chair of ALA's Privacy Subcommittee. And I also work as division director for the Alameda County Library here in California, um, where I oversee our, our learning group. And my division is actually comprised of what we refer to as our equity department. So I oversee our social justice, mobile and outreach, education and literacy, youth and family departments, and our technical services department as well. So my day-to-day -day job, I think, perfectly actually dovetails nicely into the national privacy work that I do, um, and that we'll be talking about these intersections today, about the intersection between equity and privacy. But I think it's really important to throw that kind of out onto the table right, right away. Um, uh, as libraries continue to stress the importance of equity in all of our conversations, we also need to recognize and um, realize that privacy and intellectual freedom go hand in hand and support all of the equity and social justice work that we do. I just started my third term as the chair of the Privacy Subcommittee, and uh, that subcommittee actually lives under the Intellectual Freedom Committee. Our responsibilities are to push forward privacy-related policies, guidelines, and tools. And I've been striving to increase privacy awareness around, uh, sorry, increase awareness around privacy in libraries and to advocate for strong privacy standards across the profession. So this afternoon, I'm gonna share with you some of the tools that are currently available and things that are coming soon that will help you uh, be a strong privacy advocate in your library. Um, before we even get started on all of that, I just wanna recognize that the world is a um, crazy, scary place for a lot of people right now. Um, and I really appreciate everybody taking the time to be here this morning. Um, I'm hoping that we can have a little bit of a conversation and move forward um, and get energized this morning. Um, but also, you know, take that self-care moment and take those moments for just a deep breath and we're in this together. And um, yeah, thank you all for being here. So I actually want to start out um, and just take a moment of pause to think about what privacy means to you. So when I say the word privacy, what images or definitions come to mind? What broadly does privacy mean to you? Um, and so I'd ask you just to go ahead and, and start typing those things into the chat box and just type out what, what pictures come to mind, what pops into your head. Um, and we can kind of look at some of those together. Let me pull up the chat box so I can see that too. I'm gonna ask for Becky's help on this one too to kind of go over yeah. some of the stuff that's coming up in the chat so, box of your talk. It's a little hard to see all of it uh, when I'm sharing. Yeah, we have um, my patron records, what happens in my house is private, my reading history, big data, protection, hiding personal details, freedom. Um, we also have in this chat, oral history interview protection, internet searches, being able to share what I want to share when I want to share, not shared without my permission. <laughs> HIPAA. Yeah, yeah. HIPAA has come up a lot recently with uh, COVID and how libraries are responding to that and thinking about things like health checks. And I love, I love freedom and um, people talking about that right to choose, right? I, I want to share what I want to share and I want to have control over it. I think for a lot of years, we've been told this notion that people don't care about privacy. And how many of you have heard, well, people just hand over their information to anyone. They don't care. Um, I'll actually argue that that's a false narrative that's been sold to us by the tech industry. It's actually not that people don't care about privacy. They just didn't understand how it was, their data was being used. And once they began to figure it out, they were enraged. I mean, look at Cambridge Analytica scandals as a perfect example. We're seeing these sweeping privacy legislations being passed around the world, including GDPR in the EU and the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, people do care about privacy. However, most of tech doesn't not, and they have started to shift our definition of privacy. So I, I think we see this most often in the reframing of privacy policies. 
So if our definition of privacy, right, is to keep information that I share with someone a secret, right? I share this information with you and then you don't tell anybody unless I give you permission. Um, then a privacy policy probably shouldn't be called a privacy policy, but rather a data management and security policy. It tells people how a company or a library or someone um, uses and takes your information and then how they share it with others, especially in the social media realm. But we as libraries have an ethical obligation to privacy. And, um, but in today's world, you know, with such disambiguous definitions, what does that really even mean? So in libraries, the right to privacy is the right to open inquiry without having the subject of one's interest examined or scrutinized by others. Privacy is essential to the exercise of free speech, free thought, and free association. When we have a lack of privacy and confidentiality, it chills people's choices, thereby suppressing access to ideas. The possibility, even just the possibility of surveillance, whether direct or through access to records of speech, research, and exploration, undermines a democratic society. We are living through a moment in history when the preservation of democratic ideals is under attack from various fronts. Preserving a place where we have free, private access to ideas and knowledge where someone won't be judged by others is absolutely critical to upholding our democracy. Like I continue to see libraries relinquishing this commitment to privacy and honestly, it kind of scares the crap out of me. I've heard people say that libraries are in competition with Amazon or Google. We're, we're not. Get that out of your head. I've, I've literally sat in presentations where vendors told us that we're in competition with Google and Amazon. If we were in competition, I, I'm telling you, we would lose. We're, we don't have those resources in the same way, and we're not a bookstore or a place just to deliver books and programs to people. Instead, I'd like to propose to you that we are fundamentally different from any other institution that exists. And one of the key ways that we differ is this expectation of privacy that we give to our users. There's an abundance of research out there that suggests that people's behavior changes when they know they're being surveilled. We operate in a world today where there are virtually no options for accessing information without being tracked. Libraries are the last bastion of privacy in this world, but we're quickly losing that fundamental piece of who we are and what separates us from all other institutions and businesses that exist. So where does this commitment and obligation to privacy come from? Um, I think it began with having a professional code of ethics. You know, libraries are one of the most trusted institutions in the world. Did we get there by establishing a code of ethics and living up to it? Uh, our code of ethics was actually adopted in 1939, um, with privacy being a core component of the profession since, but it has merged and grown and changed over the years. Um, the third item on our code states, we protect each library's user's right to the privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. So, um, do you think we're still living up to our ethical commitments? And I'll kind of give people a, a quick moment to type in the chat there and, and see what your thoughts are just about the code of ethics. And, and then maybe Becky can share with us some of those thoughts. I definitely will. We have had a couple other things come in saying libraries are already what Google aspires to be. Um, Um, and with libraries having to keep slash provide information for COVID and contact tracing. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep on moving along there, but keep, keep on keep uh, adding your comments in there and we'll pause periodically to check in with one another. So we, we also have this commitment in our library bill of, we have a privacy commitment in our library bill of rights, which is the public facing commitment that we make to all of our users. We've seen this larger assault on privacy rights of our users over the years. And we had a commitment in the code of ethics, but there actually was no mention until recently in the privacy bill of rights. Um, our subcommittee noticed this and actually moved forward a new article to be added to that bill of rights in January, 2019, affirming that commitment to privacy. So you can now get article seven 
which says all people, regardless of origin, age, background, or views, possess a right to privacy and confidentiality in their library use. Libraries should advocate for, educate about, and protect people's privacy, safeguarding all library use data, including personal identifiable information. I've included a link here on the slide to where you can um, actually get the interpretations for the Bill of Rights as well. This gives you a more detailed look into what that statement really means and the expectations around privacy in libraries. Also, just a little plug, um, the 10th edition of the Intellectual Freedom Manual is going to be released uh, this fall. You can order copies now. So please go to the ALA store and do. It's a really great text. Um, works on that a lot with the Intellectual Freedom Committee. And it's a really valuable resource I highly recommend. So libraries have a long history of fighting back against surveillance of our users. How many of you are familiar with Section 215 of the Patriot Act? You can actually um, you know, raise your hand in the participant box if you want, so we can all see how many people um, are familiar. So Section 215 is often referred to as the library provisions, uh, re library records provision. Uh, this is because the FBI actually is allowed to obtain library records of anyone when they present facts showing reasonable grounds um, and to believe that the records are relevant to an authorized investigation. Libraries, they receive a national um, security letter, which instructs them to hand over any records they have on a user, anything. The library is then under a gag order through these letters. They're not even allowed to contact legal counsel or inform the user of the transmission of records. But in 2005, uh, George Christian of Connecticut received one of these letters. He and his colleagues contacted the American Civil Liberties Union and fought back. The FBI withdrew their request for information, releasing them from the gag order, which is really the only reason that we even know it happened in the first place. How many other libraries in the last 15 years have received these requests? How many of our vendors have received them and willingly turned over information without a fight? as they are not bound, they're not bound by our code of ethics or bill of rights. How many of you would be willing to have that label of America's most dangerous librarians? That's kind of a cool life label, I have to admit, but I think a lot of people, there's, a, there's so much fear around that, um, getting that letter and how many people are willing or even able to fight back against it. Libraries across the country began the, uh, to change the way we operated after the Patriot Act was put in place. So we shifted away from card catalogs more into the world of the digital ILS, and we made it standard practice to delete user records after books were returned. If the data didn't exist for the government to take, then we wouldn't have anything to give when they came knocking. However, as the Patriot Act became a fact of life and mass surveillance became the norm with the internet penetrating every aspect of our lives, libraries became complacent. We've jumped at the opportunities for data analytics and swallowed up whole lines from vendors that they've sold to us about the need and requirements per, for pervasive tracking of our users. We felt immense pressure from our governing bodies to prove our worth through measured analytics, sometimes going as far as installing facial recognition software inside of our libraries and literally tracking a user's every movement inside of our buildings. Instead of being fierce privacy advocates, many of us have found ourselves as part of the surveillance state, not sure how we got here ourselves or how we can unwind returning to a strong base of privacy for our users. We find ourselves standing on the edge of a trust cliff. So trust is one of those things that's extremely hard to earn and once you lose it, it's almost impossible to get back. As I mentioned earlier, libraries are one of the most trusted institutions out there and yet, we are about to step over that trust cliff. If we share user information with third parties or use it in a manner that they don't consent to, we rapidly lose trust and fall off the cliff. We enter into an agreement with our users that we will be good stewards of their information using only what we need and being totally transparent with what we collect, why we collect it, and how it's used. If we stop being transparent or start using data in ways that we have not been consented to, users will stop trusting us and they'll stop using libraries because we'll become bookstores, we'll become something different than what we are. We have to start asking ourselves some really hard questions about how we respect user privacy while still getting the data that we need to operate. We have to have challenging conversations with our administrators and vendors about the role of the library and how we can maintain our positions as that trusted institution. 
as privacy becomes a scarcity in the world, it becomes even more sacred within libraries. I think we have an opportunity right now in this moment in time to take a stand. We can affirm our commitment to privacy and ensure that libraries are safe havens from surveillance. We can actually cement our place in history as the one place where you can go to access information without being tracked and monitored. We can be the one place where anyone can seek out free information without fear of reprisal. We can be the Faraday cage of the future, if you will. There's, there's a lot of work to be done in order to fashion ourselves as information safe harbors. Unfortunately, you know, in many cases, libraries are speaking out of both sides of their mouth. We're telling users that we're fierce privacy advocates, and yet at the same time, we're keeping tabs on their every movement within the library and sharing their library use with third party vendors that harvest um, as much data as possible. Currently, though, there are a lot of privacy projects out there across the country in academic, public, school libraries that um, are, are, help, are trying to build this support and are trying to change the landscape. Um, many of these initiatives may be useful to you and your staff um, as you figure out how you can be a privacy-focused institution. There's a lot out there. It, it doesn't mean you have to do everything. It doesn't mean you have to do everything at once. It means taking a step and exploring resources and starting the work. So let's talk about some of the stuff that's out there. In 2018 and 2019, a national forum on web privacy and web analytics was an IMLS funded community fueled project to shape a better analytics practice that protects our users' privacy from unwanted third party tracking and targeting. So there's actually a lot of great resources here. This is um, a little bit more of a bend to academia, but I think actually really applicable to, for any type of resource. Um, the link is right on, on here. And if you go there, you can find an action handbook. This is a practice oriented guide that provides background resources and good practices to guide you in ethically implementing web analytics with a view towards privacy. So again, this is not asking anyone to be hardline, don't look at any data, don't do anything. Um, it's about finding those balancing points. Uh, it's not, there's no black and white here at all, like most of the world, shades of gray. And so we have to use tools to be privacy conscious in how we collect things. So we can still use web analytics, but we need to look at how we're using it and how we can set up the structures and that guidebook will help you do, do that. In addition, they've also created these eight pathways for action um, for enhancing web privacy. So all these pathways are areas that they found in their research that actually need more exploration. What they've done is build out these short frameworks of the problem, the impacts and the outcomes and potential stakeholders. And so they're actually really good starting points for your library. You can take one of those pathways and then um, create, explore it and create, um, create a new project for yourself. And then how many of you have heard of Allison Macrina's work with the Library Freedom Institute? Feel free to, to raise your hand um, or uh, leave some chats about your experience in the chat box if you've been part of that project or heard about it. Allison's been doing a fantastic job in training library staff to become fierce privacy advocates. So Allison's approach is actually not to inform just about library privacy, but privacy as a whole. And it's a really intensive six month program that teaches librarians the fundamentals of privacy and how they can go out and make changes, real changes in their community. Um, I found my time in working on privacy related issues in libraries that getting buy-in from administration is only a part of the solution. Administrators play this really big role in negotiating contracts, writing policies, but all that only goes so far without buy-in from frontline staff. So Allison's crew at LFI is turning out librarians who are educated about privacy and they wanna talk about it. They're advocating for change and they're pushing to make it happen. Additionally, my team within the Privacy Subcommittee has been working really hard the last few years within the boundaries of ALA. And so we've been looking to find paths to make change and long lasting change for the library institution as a whole by working within the system. Um, we need frontline privacy advocates that are educating users and pushing for social change as a whole. And we need people who are well-versed in policy and systems to change the structures 
both of these things have to happen simultaneously. And so I think that enables us to all have roles to play, whether you're a frontline page or you're a director of a library system. So in addition to getting the new privacy focused article through the Bill of Rights, we also unanimously passed a privacy resolution through council at the last midwinter. So this resolution acknowledged that there is a major and fundamental misalignment between vendor privacy policies and ALA policies and ethical codes. With the advancements of technology, we see the private sector creating this vast set of tools that enable the surveillance of us all. Instead of libraries working with vendors to create tools that are privacy focused, we've fallen in line with tech industry standards. Um, I've literally had vendors tell me that, well, you know, my, our policy is this way because this is the tech industry standard. Um, not, they're not building tools that are for libraries. They're adapting tools that are not for libraries and then repackaging them for us. So this working group will actually come together. We have a list of major vendors um, and librarians who are well-versed in the privacy sector to come together and talk about what the current issues are, um, create a shared set of standards and develop transparency around what vendors are doing with user data. Now, I, I will say as with most things, I'm sure you're all aware, COVID has pushed our timeline back on this initiative. We were hoping to get started, but passed the resolution two months before all the shutdown happened. So. Um, we're looking at getting back on schedule um, and starting this group in the beginning of the new year. So stay tuned, more information coming out, of, out about that. Now, when I speak to librarians about their biggest challenges or frustrations around privacy, I mostly hear about vendors. I hear about how OverDrive doesn't ever delete a user's history. You can actually see mine on the screen here because we have the California Consumer Privacy Act here. I was able to request all of my data. Um, we actually have a, a librarian who's doing a blog post, several blog posts that will be coming out soon on the Choose Privacy Every Day site, which will detail her experience in collecting vendor data information. Um, I hear about Gale's analytics on demand that allows you to sync your ILS data to Experian consumer credit profiles. So actually this map on the screen is from a library that published um, a report online and every single dot you see there is actually a house with library cards. I found that through a Google search. Uh, if you wanna learn more about Gale in analytics on demand, I highly recommend Santa Cruz um, did a grand jury report where they admonish the library for a really flagrant disregard of user privacy. I hear about Orange Boy Susanna, customer relationship management tool. Doesn't even have a publicly available privacy policy. They write a custom one for each library, even though it sucks down an incredible amount of PII and analyzes reading habits without user consent or knowledge. And of course, I had to lead this, I led this national campaign against LinkedIn as they tried to force public library users to create public social media profiles in order to use the library product. And that particular fight was so intense, I learned a lot about what it takes to lead national campaigns, but, and I'm proud that our, feet, our pushback was enough to force them to at least stop and reimagine how they would allow users to gain access. But even so, users are, um, while not forced to create a profile, they're highly encouraged to do so. I've just gotten emails that a new LinkedIn learning is coming out that I haven't even gotten to look at. So we'll see what that's like. Um, but as I was speaking to libraries around the country, I found myself getting tremendous support from some administrations, a lot of support from the libraries in New York. Um, but I found myself facing some pretty fierce pushback from other library directors and heads of large consortiums, some of whom in the past have been known as really privacy conscious systems. I was being told by leaders of major institutions that LinkedIn had assured them that everything was fine and therefore everything was fine. Uh, LinkedIn told me that they were acting quote unquote in the spirit of our code of ethics. And this brings me to the second largest challenge that I hear from librarians and that's a lack of understanding and support from their administrators. I've heard of administrators telling mistruths to their staff about vendor practices or downplaying the vital role that privacy plays in the library. For any of you who are administrators here today, the burden lies on us 
to be the strongest privacy advocates. Staff look to us for guidance on these issues. We have to be educated and we have to feel empowered to speak honestly with staff about the decisions we make in regard to user privacy. So I wanna do a little quick activity together. I wish we had a little bit more time to flush it out, but we'll, we'll explore this together. So in order to put privacy first, we have to identify what must, must be, might be holding us back, what barriers we might need to overcome to get where we wanna go. And we need to talk about what a privacy focused library looks like to you. So I want us to start with aspirations. Can people type into the chat box what aspirations you have or for your library around um, privacy? Trust from patrons, avoid lawsuits, question mark. Uh, privacy literate patrons. To be able to promote it as a service. Oh, nice, I like that. Um, that people would know we conserve their privacy. It's a good place to go. <laughs> I love that idea of like, you know, letting people know that we're privacy focused, right? Yeah. You even know that's the thing that libraries are about. Hey, Erin, can you just repeat the question? A couple people said they didn't quite catch it. Yeah. What aspirations do you have for your library around privacy? And then we just got um, supportive government policy, consciously guard privacy of new Americans and literacy programs, mm. um, that it exists and is seamless for the public. Um, I would like to figure out how patrons can share their reading list with others and find those with like interests, but I don't know how to do that and maintain privacy. Um, guard privacy of financial and legal docs. More education about privacy, surveillance, and data mining. Nice. Thank you for sharing those. So now I want you to talk about, put in the chat box, what barriers are you facing that are preventing you from meeting those aspirations? So what barriers are you facing? Um, while we're waiting for that, we had a couple more, uh, more visibility yeah. of privacy tools and services for patrons and have patrons have an awareness of what their privacy choices are and how to make them. Choice is such an important part of that. You know, someone asked about the um, book list and I don't think there's anything necessarily inherently wrong with people sharing, but it's, it's that we're allowing them, and we'll talk about this in, the, in a little bit, it's allowing them to understand how they're sharing, what they're sharing and how it all works, making the choice. Um, so we have, let's see, um, more understanding of the creepy slash cool aspect, barrier, the tech, itse tech itself, um, staff training, computer literacy. Lots of patrons are scrambling to keep up with tech and they feel overwhelmed. Yeah, I think those are all totally valid barriers. You know, the tech, if the tech itself is not created in a privacy conscious way, how do we, how do we use it? How do we get there? Yeah, and then on the Zoom chat, I have, let's see, up-to-date library worker understanding of privacy, public ignorance of how their data is being used, not just in the library, but by other communication sources, um, tools to manage privacy. Let's see, patrons seem to be less concerned about privacy than we are. <laughs> yeah, and I hear that a lot, and I think, you know, that has several different components to it. But also that at the end of the day, um, it's, our, it's our responsibility to be protecting that privacy. And um, even if we think people don't care, I think a lot of that is a lack of education. Um, and that's something that we can talk about and we can use small moments in time to do little bits. It doesn't always have to be privacy workshops and bringing people in for this. And I think you and, New York, and, and the New York libraries have done a really good job about this, of, of giving out little bits of privacy education whenever you can and making it part of the regular conversation. Um, so, so this actually exercise, I usually like to do it with like sticky notes and put everything up there. And I usually do it before any kind of major project or undertaking. And it helps me to build up my how many questions. So this question then serves the framework for me to determine the next steps and gives guidance in creating solutions to that problem. 
Um, you can raise your hand. How many of you have created how might we statements before or done kind of that exercise? Um, a how might we statement is should be broad enough to give us lots of solutions. So I'm going to give you a short example from a recent project that I've been working on. My mobile and outreach services department just finished building a new fleet of vehicles. We've um, only had one bookmobile before. It was over 15 years old. And when we started the plan, we sat down to determine what problem we were trying to solve. So instead of saying, how might we build a new bookmobile? We structured our question as, how might we build relationships and not just deliver books? So this drove us to actually build an equity service model instead of one based on convenience. And the design of our new mobile libraries is heavily influenced by this relationship building, not book delivery. And we continually reflect back on this question regularly. It's even hanging on my wall as a constant reminder of the direction we're moving in. So how might we questions can always be refined and adjusted as data is gathered, but it's important to understand the problem before you're trying to solve it. So we don't have time today to kind of do this exercise together, but I invite you to go back to your libraries and start this conversation with staff. You know, do an aspirations and barriers exercise around privacy. Then start to brainstorm that privacy problem statement. You know, maybe it's around staff training, which people mentioned, or user knowledge. It could be around um, how do we adjust and review our vendor contracts. Uh, it could be around privacy audits. Uh, whatever you decide to start with, use that, that problem statement's going to morph and change over time as you start putting solutions in play. So come back to it and keep on coming back to it and adjusting and being responsive as you add new services. So just like we have to determine what problem we're trying to solve, we need to have a deep understanding of what's currently happening in our libraries. And in order to do this, we need to perform a privacy audit. Um, you can raise your hand if you've done a privacy audit before. Um, it is and can be, it can feel like a really, oh good, looks like several people have done these before. It can feel overwhelming. I put that up front. It can totally feel overwhelming, especially if you're at a big, huge library um, system. It's entirely possible it'll take you over a year to complete. That's okay. Uh, the first time you run an audit is gonna be the hardest and it's gonna be to take you the most time, um, but it's a really critical part that something that every library really should be doing to understand how, how they are, their vendors, their partners, administrators, everyone is handling user data. And as you begin to understand how data is being collected, shared and stored, you'll be able to see how you can ensure that your library is in alignment with the libraries, and I mean like, the Royal Weed Library, how your library is in alignment with our industry standards and not tech industry standards. So the first step will be to think about all of the different places that you'll need to audit. What areas in your libraries touch user data? Your ILS, learning analytics, website, vendors, volunteer management. For each of these areas, you'll wanna identify and then ask yourself a set of core questions. Core questions. So what information do you collect? Why do you collect it? How do you collect it? Do you need to collect it? What are your storage and retention policies and procedures? Is the user data shared with or collected by third-party vendors? And if so, what vendors are used? What information is shared and collected by the vendor? Is the information collected by the vendor necessary for business operations? What are the vendor's privacy policies and do they align with your library? What are the current best practices and policies out there? And what changes need to be made to ensure the privacy and security of user data? Now this course set of questions is a great starting place for any audit, but the next step is then to dig in deeper and align your library with the privacy guidelines established by ALA. So the Intellectual Freedom Committee, the Privacy Subcommittee, and members of LIDA created a set of guidelines and checklists, and they're available to assist librarians, libraries, schools, and vendors to develop best practices for online privacy, data management, and security. So these guidelines and checklists were created for every library, any size to be able to use. And the way that we did this, um, we actually, if you go to the checklist, they're broken down into three priority levels. So priority one items should be achievable by every library or vendor. These are must do. Priority two will be able to be met by larger systems, those with more control over their IT infrastructures. And priority three are for those libraries with deeper technological understanding and resources. And some of those might even be optional. So you can use these checklists as part of your audit process. They'll enable your library to be in alignment with, kind of, with our industry standards. 
The Privacy Subcommittee actually recently released new guidelines for vendors. These are actually meant to be used by vendors and libraries, not putting the burden on libraries to always be checking or chasing a vendor down to care about privacy. The corresponding checklist um, has been completed. It's actually going to a vote with the IFC in, in two weeks. So expect that a new checklist will be up in December. And this year, our team, the Privacy Subcommittee, is actually reviewing all of the guidelines and checklists to update them and make sure that they're still current and useful to everyone. Now, as you move through this audit process, you'll also want to ask yourself core questions and check to see where you're in alignment with those guidelines, moving through each checklist item. And when I, um, if you keep track, you're actually able to tell your audit story. When I ran this process as the innovations manager at San Jose Public Library, it took us about a year and a half. Um, and each department that touched user data wrote a white paper that answered the core questions, showed where they were in compliance, and outlined the steps they were going to take to make the needed changes. And in order to be completely transparent, we then published all of these white papers on the website. You can actually go um, to their site there. Um, and if you actually browse around on their privacy site, you'll see a privacy literacy tool that your library is welcome to use and share and put on your website that guides um, users through creating their own personalized privacy toolkit. So this is not a one and done project, it's a process. And I found that when you get this audit started, it starts you talking about privacy, it gives you a platform to start the conversations in a really focused manner. When we began talking about privacy at every meeting, um, by the time we were finished with the audit, I had frontline library staff emailing me privacy policies from vendors and asking questions about practices without any prompting by me. It just became part of the, the culture. And some of the things you might discover during the audit process is that you don't have any policies or procedures in place that directly address privacy. Think about, do you, do you have a right library privacy policy right now? Um, do you understand what's in it? How many of your staff know what's in it? Is it easy to find in your website? Is it written in plain English so that anyone can understand what it means? Privacy policies are a really critical piece of ensuring this, this transparency around your data practices. They need to be clearly and explicitly, um, they need to clearly and explicitly inform your users about how their data is being used, shared, and secured. But in addition to the privacy policy, your library needs to create procedures for staff to follow as well. They should have guidelines about how to secure user data that's written on paper, um, how to answer requests from law enforcement, what data they're allowed to collect for programs and services, and best practices around disclosure of that user data to fellow staff. And decisions also need to be made around informed consent. So people are more comfortable sharing their data if they're able to consent to how it's being used and have transparency around when and how. So, Think about how are you currently getting the consent of your users? And feel free to type in the chat box if you want to um, talk about how your library is currently handling informed consent. Uh, the current industry standards, tech industry standards around consent are basically a joke. Um, people have to click a terms of service agreement in order to use a product. And if they don't agree, then they can't access the service. Everyone just clicks agree without reading anything. They know there aren't any options. And the agreements or privacy policies are often written in such obfuscating language that no one actually knows what they're agreeing to anyway. We have to do better. We have to establish informed consent protocols and ensure that we keep the trust of our users. If your current policy is that just anyone who has a library card agrees that you can do whatever you want with their data, that's not good enough. We're not Google or Amazon or Facebook. We have an ethical and sometimes legal commitment to real privacy. This means we have to be the one creating the playbook for informed consent and privacy practices. We have to think outside the box about how we collect data, and why we collect it, and how we're working with our users so they know what's happening. So how many of you are utilizing some form of analytics in your library? Feel free to raise your hand on that one. So a few of you at least are, are using some kind of analytics software at your library. Now, how many of you are facing pressure to do so in order to prove your worth? How many of you are pushing back against this level of data tracking and collection? I, I know academic libraries especially are facing this pressure more, even more so than public libraries, but it's starting to infiltrate all library ecospheres. 
these tools that were originally built to sell products are now being adapted for use in libraries and college campuses. We're seeing Bluetooth beacons that were originally designed to track movements in stores being added to classrooms and libraries. Customer relations management tools that were designed to predict shopping behavior and then push targeted marketing are now being used to analyze library use and push out recommendations to users. All of this is being done without asking anyone to opt in. We look at it as, as trying to, we look at it as us doing a good thing for our users. We're helping them know what the library has. We're, we're teaching them about our services, but we're sacrificing their ability to opt in and their, and our commitment to privacy in order to, to market to them. And is that really our goal? And is that what we should be doing? And we need to ask ourselves, is tracking library use behavior really telling the impact of libraries and what impact our libraries have on users' lives. It's definitely easier and faster than speaking with our users, but does it actually give us the data that matters? So as I began my work in privacy, I quickly discovered that it's an equity issue. Uh, the privacy of the library is what has enabled LGBTQ teens to discover resources without their parents knowing. It's what allows young women to find, who find themselves in unexpected and unplanned pregnancy to find information about an abortion or an affordable clinic nearby. It's what it allows in a domestic abuse, uh, a domestic violence survivor to come in and ask where they can find a shelter. Now, library privacy is what has enabled the exploration of taboo subjects by scholars for generations. Without library privacy, will your undocumented population feel safe coming into the library to explore sensitive topics? Will you deny someone the opportunity to seek out sensitive information that they don't want linked back to them? Surveillance will always disproportionately impact our minority and marginalized populations. If you have enough money, you can buy your way out of the, mostly out of the surveillance ecosphere. You can purchase an iPhone rather than an Android that's full of bloatware that demands your personal information in order to function. You can care less about the app tracking your attendance in class when you don't have to work a full-time job to support yourself and your child in addition to going to school full-time. We have to design our data collection with these users in mind first. It's actually an exciting opportunity. It's an opportunity to create new systems of showing impact and not falling back on what our vendors are telling us is the knight in shining armor that will save our libraries. If your administration or local governing body wants you to track an individual user's library use behavior, then they actually don't want a library. They want a bookstore. Privacy and intellectual freedom are a core part of what sets a library apart. Without it, we're not able to keep our trust and we'll begin to erode what makes the library so special in the first place. It can feel scary to push back when funding is on the line. Many of us do not wanna jeopardize our users access and as such, we, we accept vendor contracts, however they're written. We go along with tracking initiatives because we don't want funding pulled from vital programs and services. However, if we do not become strong privacy advocates, we risk falling off that trust list and never being able to pull ourselves up. I'm here today to tell you that the house is on fire. Right now, just a corner is burning. It can still be put out with a good fire extinguisher, but it's spreading and it will be completely out of control. None of you need to become privacy experts. Not a single one of you in here needs to become a privacy expert. But you do need to start putting practices in place that will ensure your library remains a safe place for anyone who wants to explore whatever topic interests them. Frontline staff need to hear from their administrators that privacy is important and see them stand up for privacy rights. Frontline staff out there, I encourage you to push back when you see privacy violations you see in the library. Seek out training, get into the Library Freedom Institute to learn more about becoming that fierce privacy advocate. I encourage you to look at what Cornell Library is doing with their privacy services. They are making strong statements. They're providing resources to students. So they're demanding better from their vendors. The Library of the Bill of Rights from ALA can sometimes feel like this just far away statement. Uh, for many of which, it's, it's uh, why it's so important that we collectively push forward our own privacy standards. We have to band together as, as, as an association to come out with policies and guidelines. The big libraries out there that are on the call, it is up to us to set 
this gold standard so that we can support those libraries that have funding on, uh, you know, on the chopping block. We have to work together as a whole in order to make these changes happen. And it's not gonna happen overnight, but we take little chips away at it and it makes a difference. Every step you make makes a difference. So I hope you don't leave here feeling more overwhelmed than when you came in. Um, I do understand I've just dumped a bunch of new information on you, um, but I do wanna leave you with some knowledge about upcoming resources that I really will, I hope will assist your libraries in making these changes and make them real actionable. I'm currently co-leading an IMLS project to create what are called privacy field guides. I'm working on this project with Bonnie Tejerina. She's a researcher from Data and Society in New York. Um, and she comes from an academic library background. And we will be publishing seven guides by the end of next year. We were, this is another thing that got majorly delayed by COVID, um, but they're gonna cover a wide range of privacy topics. So the first guides that we'll publish will be on data life cycles, privacy policies, audits, how to talk about privacy, vendor security, non-tech privacy, and digital security basics. And what we've done is we've actually written these guides to be practical and easy to use. They're not about making you an expert in data life cycles. They're about giving you step-by-step -step activities to become a strong privacy advocate and actually put all of these practices in place. So all of them have just a tiny bit of information and then actionable things to do. We're gonna be seeking out test libraries in probably late spring to early summer. So I'll make sure that information gets out to, to the association when that time comes. In the meantime, please visit, it's Choose Privacy Every Day. It's our um, privacy subcommittee's website. We post weekly privacy news updates. That's so just privacy as a whole. We just established our first team of bloggers and they're posting new content now every month. You can subscribe to that and you'll get the news updates and the blog updates. Um, the site is actually getting a redesign this year. So it will make it easier to find all the tools that you need to create a strong privacy focused library. My Twitter handle's right there. You can also always email me. I'm happy to always hop on a call um, or answer emails if you have privacy questions. That's why the subcommittee is there. We're here to support you and to help you learn more and to explore anything. So thank you so much for being here. And I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So I'm gonna stop my screen share right now. Yeah, we've got a um, we've got a couple questions, and before we get to those, if you also want to ask a live question, you can raise your hands, and I'll get to you and mute and unmute you. I just want to point out that Tim Fergal did drop the uh, a link to the Cornell privacy policy in the chat, so that's there. Um, Barbara Stripling from uh, iSchool at Syracuse asks: Is it a violation of privacy if data are anonymized but grouped and categorized? So I think. I, I would need to know more about the, the circumstances in particular, but um, the anonymization of data is kind of a misnomer. It's basically impossible to actually anonymize anything. Um, just stripping out someone's name doesn't really, doesn't really anonymize anything. But Barbara, if you wanna um, hop on the, the microphone, I'm happy to, to talk more about that if you'd like. Great, I'll look for Barbara's hand. And then we had a couple questions about contact tracing. Um, you know, are we violating our patrons' privacy by contact tracing? It is voluntary and we ask them to sign in with a name and phone number. And then somebody asked, you know, do, they, do you tell them that if they don't, do you not let them in if you don't, if they don't? And do they know they can refuse? And someone else asked if you could touch base on tracing and appointments. Yeah, for sure. So I'm actually going to put into the chat box here, we um, have an article that we wrote about contact tracing um, in the beginning of COVID, and that's on the Choose, um, Choose Privacy website. So um, if your library is doing contact tracing, and it's um, your decision to do it and not public health demanding, I would ask that, that you stop doing it. It is a huge violation of everyone's access rights. We should not be denying anyone access to the library. Public health can certainly do contact tracing, um, but telling someone that the only way that they're allowed to come into the library is that they give over their identity is, is pretty not okay as far as giving, ensuring that everyone has access 
to our services in, a, in an anonymous manner. So if you have to have appointments to come in, that's fine, but you should have someone have the option to say, I wanna set up an appointment, but I don't wanna give my name or I wanna give a false name and I will give you that false name when I come to the door, but it should be an option for everyone to always access library services without identifying themselves. And it looks like Barbara, you got your hand raised and unmuted. So Barbara, if you wanna go ahead and uh, ask a little bit more in detail about your question. Um, yes, I am interested in the idea of uh, using data for our own library services. And I could imagine a scenario where um, you don't pay attention to what individuals have checked out or um, specific checkouts, but you recognize trends and you use those trends to maybe recruit public services. And so you're seeing a trend among teenagers in investigating violence. And so you appeal to the city council for funds based on that aggregated data, not individual data. But that tells you something about the teens in the community. So I'm just, I'm wondering where the line and balance is. Yeah, I think it just depends on how you're collecting the information to begin with. So, you know, data, I, I'm a huge data fan. There's lots of great things that we can do and we should be collecting data. Um, so I think you need to look at like, are you collecting it with the person's name attached to it first with their personally identifiable information attached to it to begin with? and then stripping that out? Or are you collecting information that never has that information attached to it in the first place and you really are collecting it in aggregate? Um, and, and that's really powerful. I would also invite you to look at, is that data really showing you what you need to know or is going out and talking to the teens in your community the way to know what's going on? So that's a much harder approach, but I think sometimes a lot of our data also will only show us a part of the picture. So I think about things like, um, if you just are looking at checkout data, you're only looking at what people are actually checking out. In a lot of our lower income communities, people don't check out books as much. They come to the library and utilize the books, but they don't check them out as much. And so are you missing whole swaths of the population because you have a very narrow look at what a user is in your library? So it's, yes, totally, Barbara, you should be collecting data and analyzing it to view trends, but just have a privacy conscious mind when you're doing it and asking yourself, are we collecting, why do we need to collect this data? Do we have a business purpose for it? Are we being respectful of a user's personally identifiable information? If we need to use their personally identifiable information to do this service or to collect this information, how are we gaining their consent before doing so? Um, we have a couple other questions. Um, sure. What roles should our library's systems play in securing the privacy of our patrons' information, et cetera? Um, Sorry, can you repeat that question again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what roles should our library's systems play in securing the privacy of our patrons' information, et cetera? Well, some of this is legal, right? And so we actually, um, you know, New York Library and, and pretty much every other library, library state, uh, sorry, every state out there has library confidentiality laws in place. Um, these laws were mostly written in like the 80s. Um, I've actually been in talk with some New York librarians out there about um, working together to update the New York state law. But I highly recommend if you haven't looked at your laws yet, that's the first place to start is like, what are our legal obligations as far as sharing information? And then ensuring that your system has policies and procedures in place. I think law, giving information over to law enforcement is a great example. Like do all of your frontline staff know what to do when a uniformed police officer comes in and asks for patron information? Um, it can be really intimidating for someone when a, when a law enforcement officer comes in and asks do they know to not just hand it over? Um, do they know what they should do? And having a really easy to follow guideline for staff can help. So just going through, and, and that's why that private privacy audit is really important. So you can go through and figure out, okay, where do I need to like actually follow the law? Where do I need to um, 
follow what the industry standards are and, and, and doing this. I'm, I'm afraid we're gonna hit a point where um, there's a big expose in the newspaper about um, libraries, bio, you know, security risks and data breaches. I'm gonna look up and, and put in the chat box that Santa Cruz grand jury report. Um, I think that had that grand jury report come out with a major library system, it would have been big news um, instead of it coming from a very small library system in California. Um, I think we have time. If there's any one last question, if somebody wants to raise their hand and has a question or pop it in the chat, um, we have just about two, three minutes. Um, while we're waiting, I will plug, um, since this is, this is sponsored by IFRT, the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable, I just want to say uh, James G. Neal is the winner of the Intellectual Freedom Award this year, and you can watch his speech um, in the on-demand content. Um, you can watch his acceptance speech there, so you can pop over and check that out on your lunch break. Lots of thank yous in the chat, such important information. Um, crazy times we're living in, yes, yes. Um, thank you, very informative, very informative. Um, will the slides be made available for the presentation? Yeah, all slides, I'll have Erin send me a PDF of her slides and links. Um, and then going forward with the other programs, there's a drop down, uh, there's a sessions files. You can look there. There will be stuff, handouts and things. There'll also be links in program descriptions. So as you get to sessions and stuff like that, you can look there and click, click away and everything will be made available after conference if it's not available right now. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually create a little bitly link so you can see all of my notes that, um, that I wrote uh, for this presentation. So it'll accompany the slides. So that way you can, you can feel like you can read it again and it'll have all that information there for you. I'm happy Thank to you. Share. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you everyone. Um, very important topic, very well delivered, enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we hope you continue to attend the live programs and check out the On Demand. And once again, thank you, Erin, so much. So go have some lunch and we'll see you after lunch. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. And